Yeah, this should be like this should be called like the moments when Lucas like was around iconic performances. <laughs> This is probably my least iconic character of all. Um, it's my, a movie my dad wrote and directed, and I actually remember auditioning for him in our living room in the middle of every take, being like, oh shit, like, I need to go again, I need to go again. He was like, you're doing great. He was like holding a, a home video camera. I, I, I didn't end up getting cast in that role. I got cast as an, as an extra who uh, rides down a, 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 a hallway with Heelys and says hi to the main character, and that got cut but I'm in the last scene of the movie and I look directly into the camera and it was the only take that worked, so they had to use it. So in that respect, it is iconic, I guess. I broke the fourth wall as an extra. <laughs> My dad did tell me he wanted to name the character Brad, but it never made it to IMDb. <laughs> Moonrise Kingdom. I did a school play and a casting director saw me in it and asked me to audition for that movie and I ended up getting it. And I remember Wes, it was, it was the, one of the only jobs that I've been told in person that I got the role. And he told me in front of me and my mom, he called both, both of us into the room and it was like, I was, it was the happiest, it was like the happiest day of my life. And then the next day I told everyone in my school that I was gonna be in a movie. But yeah, it's a very specific, very interesting world. And there were no trailers. Uh, we, just, we just waited in tents. We weren't allowed to talk to the main characters, Sam and Susie. Jared and Kara, we weren't allowed to talk to them. We, try, we tried to get them to come to Fast and Furious, I think, five with us. It was back when they were like in four, four or five. And Wes like put the kibosh on it. He was like, not happening today. So he wanted to create a, a disconnect between us, which existed between them in the movie. Yeah, it really felt like we went into the woods to make it. And I don't know, when I look back on it, it feels more like, I'm not even sure, sure if, if it was real in a way. It's one of those sort of fleeting memories that I can't even entirely uh, grasp. It doesn't feel tangible. But it also the Redford's based on Robert Redford. There's some sort of, they based my look off of him in Barefoot in the Park. Me and the other actors, we, wa we get, would get together to watch. Like we would like watch all of Ed Norton's movies while we were making this movie. And we watched like Primal Fear and American History X and Fight Night. A lot of those are really explicit for like 13 year olds. We ended up like asking him all about it and he was like, I don't think you guys should have seen those movies. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was really exciting. And Bill, of course, is like, was so generous and kind and his son was on the movie so we got to spend time with him. I remember feeling like so scared of how fast I was going, but after every take they were like, can he go faster? Like it looks like he's moving so slowly. But I was like, like terrified. The Grand Budapest Hotel. That, that one I remember, I was in Romania at the time and I got an email from Wes being like, hey, do you wanna come on and do a part on this? And I wrote him back the longest email being like, dude, thank you so much, this means the world to me. This is the greatest thing ever. And he was like, yeah, we're so happy to have you. It's really just like a bit part, but please, like we're so excited and I was like, Oh, don't worry. It'll, it's it, it, it's still so amazing. And anyway, I, I went up and stayed there for the week for like 30 minutes of shooting. It was like the such a um, small chunk, but they had a set that was like this, the the side of the size of this whole bowling alley for this one shot with the, with like mountains in the background that were all like c uh, scenic design and and snow and. It was it was so it was so beautiful. By the way, we're inside of a bowling alley right now. Slap. I got to work with um, uh, Peter Sarsgaard, who's just so generous and amazing to me, and really uh, made made me feel comfortable in one of the, in a moment when I was like most terrified. It was like my biggest role at the time, and I was so so scared. There's this one moment on set when. I had this whole monologue at the end of my episode and I was so nervous about it. I'm in the courtroom, it's like my character's moment and the writer and the director had like written me about it. They were like prepping me for it. Like they made it clear that I had to get it right. Like it was like, this is the moment. And after I did it, um, I was like, okay, I think it went really well. And then like Brian Cox, Tandy Newton, Zachary Quinto, Peter Sarsgaard, Tommy Sadowski, we're all sitting in the front row and all started clapping. Um, and it was like, I don't know, it was, it was the happiest moment of, of my career.
career at that moment. I was just, I felt, my mom like was recording it from a monitor. It was really, really happy. It was written by a, an, a wonderful, wonderful writer and playwright named John Robin Bates, Robbie Bates. Actually, is one of the reasons why I ended up doing Manchester by the Sea is because him and Kenny came up together in the same theater company. I asked him to write me a letter of recommendation to Kenny, so we got off on a good foot. Manchester by the Sea. The, the movie itself and the experience itself was the farthest thing from depressing. It was like Kenny and Casey are, all they did was make jokes. It's kind of amazing because I think that is, reflects pretty well at least my part of the movie. It's people who are dealing with something that's really tragic and traumatic, but there's always humor in it. And the movie does that really well. I think it finds humor in the, the awkwardness of tragedy and like tr trauma. But Kenny and Casey, I found myself just really like front, with front row seats to like a comedy show. And when Matthew Broderick was on for a few days, they just laughed and laughed and laughed. I really felt like I had been like called up. I was like a freshman and on JV baseball and I was like called up to the varsity team and there were these like older baseball players who like, I just like was so happy to be on the same team of. And, but uh, like who's, are they gonna be my guardians or are you gonna? They're gonna adopt you. We filmed that scene at like four in the morning, so it was like everything was a ha is like really hazy. I remember struggling at first, and um, it took it took it took a little while for me to find my way into that headspace. And sa sadly, it was one of the scenes where it was like the second I started to feel like I was disappointing, and they didn't make me feel this way, but the second I started feeling like I was disappointing and holding people behind, that was like where it all came from. It wasn't one of the scenes where it was like, oh, I got this from the start. It, 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 that that one was tough. They had like put all of my heaviest emotional scenes three days in a row, and it was the third day, so it felt like it felt, it felt a little dry at first, but it, it worked out. My publicist called me, <laughs> he's here, and I, I, I was convinced I wasn't going to get nominated, so I was like, I'm just going to sleep in, put my phone in airplane mode. And I woke up at like 8.01 or something and was like, ah, you know what, I'll check. And like the second, like literally five seconds after I turned my phone off airplane mode, I get a call from her. She was like, guess who just got nominated um, for an Academy Award? And I, I like sprung up, ran downstairs, and my mom was watching it on TV and my dad like ran out of the shower. And it was really, yeah, it was like total cliche, but like really exciting, like really, really exciting. I don't know, it was just, like really happy. I was just happy. <laughs> Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. I was in the middle of my, or just finished my first year at acting school, and we were studying this thing called the Gister Method, which is a method that was taught and founded by a man named Earl Gister, who taught at Yale MFA. And I remember going to first day of rehearsals with Francis and being like, look, I'm really lost. I'm in school right now. We're, we're working on this, the Gister Method. I was like, do you know what that is? And she was like, yeah, like when I was in school, we just called it Earl's class, because that was her teacher. And I was like, she, Wow, and she was like, do you want to do some of it right now? I found myself like going from the Gister Method class to like working with Frances, one of the greatest actresses alive. Somebody who learned it firsthand and was teaching it to me in a way, in a Martin McDonough film. It was, yeah, it was, it was sort of like, it made it clear to me, I was like, okay, maybe I don't need to, maybe I don't need to go back to school. I've been a huge fan of Sam's my whole life. There's, he has this one, I want to shout out one of his, most underrated performances in a movie called The Winning Season. Brilliant, brilliant performance. And I remember seeing that and being amazed by him when I was like 12 years old. Woody, of course, I grew up watching. And Peter Dinklage is, actually lives down the street from me and my dad taught him in college. My dad was his like, theater teacher. So uh, there was some overlap there. I mean, the, and those are some real iconic dudes. Lady Bird. That one was just fun. That was like, Greta always had music playing. She made me a playlist. She made everyone a playlist. Timmy had one, Saoirse had one, Beanie had one. So we all had playlists. And, and, and from the moment I got on that movie, I knew we were making something that felt timeless. And it felt like, in the same, it, it's a very different movie, but in the same way that like, people talk about Mean Girls or, 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 or a movie that survives its, its, its time, I felt like we were making that. Every day felt just like we'd get on set and it was like, oh my God, that happened, that happened, that happened. And Greta was like, she would like, I, I, we'd be in the middle of the scene and I could hear her laughing off camera. And it, 
there was a, an immediacy to to the love I felt on that set that I don't feel on most sets. Typically, it it and it, it takes until it comes out to to know that, that we're making something special. But on that one, we knew from the first day. Timmy, Sersha, and Beanie are all like. I mean, Sersha's already like has been around for so long, but Timmy and Beanie, I felt like I was seeing two great young actors like before their moment. It was even more special than working with a, with a veteran great actor in a way. It felt like we were, I was like a part of history getting to see them at that moment. Boy Erased. Boy Erased is the first time I wasn't playing like somebody's son uh, or a supporting role. It was like it was like number one on the call sheet. I felt the weight of. Of, of that story on my back in a way that was both really motivating and really, really terrifying. Particularly because it's a true story about a man I love and respect named Garrett Conley who wrote a book called Boy Erased that was the reason why I wanted to do the movies because I loved the book so much. So it felt, it felt to me like it had all the makings of something that could go really right or terribly wrong, which seemed to be the like perfect reason to do something. And Joel, of course, is uh, an amazing actor who I've known for a long time and somebody I really wanted to work with. He directed it and was acting in it, so it, it, it really was, yeah, it was a really new, it was new, a new experience. It was like a new, I, I left that movie being like, okay, I, feel, I felt like I came of age in a way doing that movie. I wanted to play the character because it seemed to me like he'd overcome more in his life. Like over the course of the span of the movie, he, he'd, he'd overcome more than I may may ever have to have to face so i wanted to learn from 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 uh from his life and and learn from his mistakes and his triumphs and life and and learn from his mistakes and his triumphs and uh and it was really really like a lot a lot a lot of fear so much fear over the course of that movie it's the character lives in a lot of fear and but but the moments of breakthrough were really really transcendent and triumphant for that reason Mid 90s. I wanted to work with Jonah absolutely, and he wrote a script I really related to and really wanted to be a part of, and felt to me like it. It felt like another world, and the, one of the things that excites me most about film is that I get to go into distinct worlds, and and have these little adventures. And this, and you watch the trailer for this movie, and it is a distinct world. <laughs> it's the mid 90s. I wear like the dopest 90s clothing in that movie, the baggiest pants, fat farm pants, and really baggy jerseys, and they got two hoop earrings and dyed hair, and, and Timberlands, and I just walk around LA, like in my in my costume, for a few, like the two weeks leading up to it, and people treated me so differently. I remember I'd go to like get food, and people would be like, you see the game last night? I'd be like, nah. But I was like, nobody's ever said that to me in my entire life, like, you catch the game? I was, like, I was like, what do people see right now when they see me? And, and I, I like registered a lot of like fear in people's eyes. Like I think there was something intimidating about me maybe. I just, I felt like I was in really great hands with Jonah and he knew what he was doing and it, it felt like a story that really mattered to him. So that was another one that was like every day on set it was like, okay, we're making a movie right now. <laughs> like in, the, in a similar way to Lady Bird with Greta, it was like, okay, um, I can't wait to, 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 to be of service to him and, and, uh, and hopefully become a part of his life because of it. Honey Boy. This is the iconic character right here. This is the iconic character. I mean, n nobody more iconic and interesting than Shia LaBeouf, in, the, in my opinion. He wrote a movie um, that's very much based on his relationship with his father. And the second I saw his name attached, I was like, okay, like I'm reading this tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, it blew me away. It felt more specific and personal and intimate than any script I'd ever read, which most, a lot of scripts can feel very formulaic and, and, and sterile. Feel like, okay, now is like when the plot moves forward. But this was like, this was like, oh, we, it was weird and interesting and crazy and politically like incorrect in a way that it felt like it was depicting people like in, 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 in this part of LA in the 90s too, in the 2000s. And I got to play somebody, base, uh, take as much inspiration or as little inspiration from who I believe to be one of the most interesting people alive and do it across from him. 
and have him as a resource whenever I needed. He's the hardest working actor I've ever worked with, uh, which made me want to step my game up. Uh, and, and I ended up going out to LA like two months in advance because I was like, this dude's been pre prepping this role his whole life. So if I don't at least give myself two months, then I'm gonna look like an idiot next to him. <laughs> so uh, I worked really hard and, and I hope it works. Ben is back. This, this one comes out in December and I never thought I'd ever wanna work with my dad uh, after how terrible he treated me during Dan in Real Life, cut me out of, no. Um, I just thought, the thought of it always seemed really uncomfortable for me and felt, felt like it would make me feel self-conscious. I didn't audition for this one, so he didn't make me read in the living room. <laughs> but I read the script, and it was one of the best parts I'd ever read for somebody my age. Felt different from anything I'd ever played, and it was right after Boy Erased, felt like a total 180. Julia's like, uh, she's a mom first. That's, and, and she had me and my dad up to her place in, in California for a week. And it's clear to me that, that she, the, the love she has for her kids is the strongest thing in her life by far. So to play her son and to deal with that energy is, re is really, really special because I was her universe. I was her whole world, her whole universe. And it's, it's nice to act across somebody who really cares about you. And, and she's so good too, like so talented. All the things that I was worried about in terms of being directed by my dad ended up playing more into my favor. It's kind of like, when, when I was doing Boy Erased and I would, f I would feel lost, I would call my dad and be like, I need help. And on this one, he, w he was my director. So I, ha I had access to the man who could put me at ease and also uh, could, could talk to me about things from my own life that would set me off emotionally in a way that he could support me in, in a way that not, not, not most directors can. Mm -hmm.